Welcome to our podcast, Doing It Right. This podcast reveals authentic stories from successful leaders doing it right. It's about their journey to become a leader, their choices, motivations, and lessons. In essence, how they built successful personal brands. Your host is Valerie Sokolowski, author of eight leadership books and nationally known as an authority on executive presence and personal branding. Let's get started. Here's Valerie. Well, I want to welcome you again. I've got my coffee cup again. This time it's filled with water. So just relax and listen to what I know is going to be a very impactful show today. Let me ask you a few questions. Have you ever had an operation? When you've had an operation, did you ever ask to meet the anesthesiologist? If you met him or her, what kind of questions did you ask? You know, these came to my mind because, gratefully, I haven't had many, but I have had operations, and the thought never went through my mind. I just depended on the doctor, and I just assumed there'd be somebody to put me to sleep. Well, today, not only do I have a wonderful man who's going to talk to you about his practice and all that he does now, but let me start the show by telling you what's most important to know about him at the very beginning. Dr. Jaffa Oda um, is now the Associate Professor of Anesthesiology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical, and also he is a critical care specialist. Well, at 17 years old, Joffer was a high school athlete that spent a lot of time running and was in sports. And then all of a sudden he had a life altering incident. I'll let him tell you the story and oh, the many lessons that he has learned. So that's all I'm going to say and I'm going to welcome, hi Joffer, thank you that I can call you that instead of doctor. Of course, absolutely, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> It's a wonderful story. It's an interesting story. It's a sad story. I could put all kinds of emotions around it. But tell us about that day that you had this experience and what it was. Yeah, so uh, a very memorable day. Uh, mm -hmm. It was, uh, I'll never forget the date, May 24th of 1998. It was uh, um, exactly one week before my high school graduation. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful sunny day and I was driving home uh, from work and uh, it was in the afternoon and uh, I fell asleep while I was driving and I was in a terrible car accident, which I'm very lucky to have survived. Um, and I'm very happy that no one else was involved. It was me um, hitting a tree, um, but it, uh, it uh, broke my neck. It fractured my spine at the cervical level um, and uh, I got a spinal cord injury from that uh, accident uh, and it left me paralyzed. Um, so uh, I am what is referred to as an incomplete quadriplegic. Um, at the very beginning, I could barely move my arms and hands and definitely not move uh, anything you know, below that. Um, but with some healing and a lot of work, I mm -hmm. regained um, the strength in my arms and hands and uh, worked very hard to regain some of my lower extremity function as well. Um, so I can stand and take a few steps, um, but I'm in a wheelchair about 99% of the time. Well, that in itself is an, an incredible story. Now add to that, why did you decide to be a doctor in the first place? It. Uh, it was always what I had wanted to do, and I, okay. I and um, ever I, I'm one of those people I can say that ever since I was a kid, I said I want to be a doctor. Were your I, parents in the no, medical field? No, no, uh -uh. Um, they weren't. Um, my my uh, parents actually were immigrants um, from the Middle East, and uh, they uh, had eight children. I'm number seven of eight. Oh my um, They uh, they were not. Um, uh, in medicine, my father studied political science and my mother um, psychology, um, but they went on to um, actually open and run a family restaurant together, which is still in business. Still Here going in strong, Dallas? In Michigan. 
Jackson, oh, in Michigan. Michigan. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, but yeah, for whatever reason, ever since I was a kid, I said I want to be a doctor. I want to study the human body. I want to help people. Um, and I just always found I've always found the human body fascinating. I still do, <laughs> of course. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So take us back a little bit mm -hmm. to um, your recovering. Yes. And how long did it take you to feel comfortable with what you were going to face the rest of your life, which is being in a wheelchair? That's an excellent question. And I think truly comfortable, <laughs> a very long time. Yeah. Um, I think I accepted very quickly, though, that I was not going to be who I was. I think that was, uh, I, I, I knew life was going to be very different. I just didn't know to what extent. Um, I had a lot of family and friends to support me through the um, initial process, which was wonderful. Um, but uh, it, it took a very long time to truly become comfortable with what my life would be. Um, but I knew very from the moment that it happened, like I said, it was a week before my high school graduation. So I just had that summer, three months to uh, before college started, my undergrad. Wow. And uh, I was insistent upon going right into my freshman year um, at the University of Michigan. Um, the doctors, of course, told me that wasn't the best idea and I should focus on my rehabilitation. But as a 17 year old, I clearly knew better. And I well. insisted on, on uh, going into my freshman year because um, I wanted to stay at the same kind of level of my, my peers and my best friend who was going to be my roommate and all of that. So uh, I did. Um, and so that summer was um, inpatient the entire I was an inpatient the entire time, uh, focusing on physical therapy and occupational therapy, and um, and you know of course you know my medical problems too. Um, and then I was discharged from the hospital one day before my freshman year started, uh, and uh, went right through um, and started college, which was quite an it's quite an experience for any 17 year old entering a major university but now I was doing it uh, in a totally different way um, but I think that also you know ignorance is bliss I had no idea what college was going to be like and now I was just <laughs> handling it from a different uh, you know in a different manner you know Joffer um, we lost a son I didn't know I would say that on camera, but we were talking about it before. And I had some strange questions asked to me. One of them was this. It was, did you get angry at God? It's an interesting question anyone would ask. Don't ever ask that <laughs> to someone that had just lost someone. Or to the point, did you ever have that angry why me? You know, it's, yes, yes. And I think it's absolutely normal yeah, absolutely. to have that feeling. And I think it's important to have that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's also important to get over it very quickly. Well, let's talk about getting over it. Mm -hmm. I loved the story in our pre-interview about a very interesting conversation <laughs> that sort of set the tone for you going forward. Mm -hmm. Tell us the story about that conversation sure absolutely um so you know i went through uh, my undergrad um knowing that i wanted to go into medical school i thought uh, getting into medical school was going to be a huge challenge um but i got accepted into medical school again at the university of michigan which was my dream that's always where i had wanted to be you know, i said when i was a kid i wanted to be a doctor and it was true and i wanted to go to medical school at university of michigan so that dream came true which was wow, wonderful that's great um it was there um that i uh, you know i i thought i wanted to be a surgeon a trauma surgeon and uh i i found in doing my surgical rotations that it wasn't actually for me and um, I discovered the field of anesthesia. I first discovered anesthesia critical care in an ICU rotation and absolutely fell in love with it. Why, and, why? Um, it was just amazing to, 
the, the process of seeing and taking care of patients that are that critically ill and to be able to turn that around completely and to, um, to watch people who are on the verge of death improve and get better and then um, make it out of the ICU and then out of the hospital onto their life was just, it's so fulfilling. Mm. Um, That's great. And on top of that, you know, there's a lot of action and adrenaline and I guess I don't, I don't really think of myself as an adrenaline junkie, but within medicine, I do. I, I really love the, you know, the, the, the really complex and crazy things that happen in medicine. It, it keeps you, keeps you on your toes and it keeps you thinking. And I love to be challenged like that. Um, so I found the ICU, I found critical care and I loved it. And then um, the next rotation was anesthesiology in the OR. And I found that taking care of patients in the OR is kind of like a mini ICU stay for that patient <laughs> while they're under anesthesia. Um, and you do everything that you have to take care of in the ICU, you're taking care of that for a patient under anesthesia, but for a shorter time. And so uh, I truly fell in love with the specialty. Um, so then the next uh, step is to find a residency. So once you're a medical student, you go to a residency program where you uh, train in your in that specialty and learn truly learn that specialty. And so I had to match into an anesthesiology uh, program. And matching means so matching is once you you um, you apply and interview at uh, many programs, and uh, when it's all said and done, you create a rank list of all of the programs that you've interviewed at, and uh, you rank them in the order that you would like to go, you know, your first choice, second choice, et cetera. And the, uh, the programs, uh, the different hospitals, they do the same thing. Of all the applicants they've had, they rank them, in the, the, and then a computer puts those lists together and um, you are matched to a program. Kind of like dating. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Matching in Matched, online. Exactly. Um, and so, um, so in the process, of course, uh, you want to have a very strong application um, and you want to have a strong interview. Um, and so uh, I had, I knew matching into a program was going to be a challenge, um, but I was confident that I could be an anesthesiologist. Um, and I was, uh, I had so many very supportive um, faculty members uh, there that really worked with me to, to, to pose very cr um, critical questions as to, you know, how will you do this? How will you do that? Um, what are you gonna do when somebody asks you this question? And so I thought that was very, very helpful, um, all in preparation to yeah. apply. And so uh, part of an ap that application process is um, to get letters of recommendation. And everybody wants to get a letter of recommendation from the department chair, uh, because that carries a lot of weight. So uh, I scheduled uh, an, an appointment with the chair um, and I met with him to discuss my application and if he'd be willing to write me a strong letter of recommendation. And he didn't know you before? Uh, not really, no. I mean, he probably knew of me, but we hadn't really had much interaction. And so um, in this meeting, um, I explained to him that I wanted to go into the field of anesthesiology and that I was applying for residency and, um, um, and I wanted his uh, feedback. And he paused and uh, he, he looked at me and he said, well, you're kind of like my 10 year old son. I was kind of confused as to where he was going with this. And I said, okay. And he said, my son loves basketball. And every time I go home, he's out shooting hoops in the driveway. And he truly believes that he's gonna become an NBA player someday. And he said, both you and I know that he's not going to become an NBA player. He said, and that's kind of like you wanting to become an anesthesiologist. Both you and I know that you can never become an anesthesiologist. Wow. And I was furious. Of course, I didn't show it. I had to be professional. And I said, why do you think I can't be an anesthesiologist? And he said, well, for obvious reasons. Oh. 
he said, you know, perhaps you'd be more suited for a field like uh, pathology or psychiatry. And I said, I don't want to be a pathologist or a psychiatrist. There's nothing wrong with those specialties, but that's not what I want to be. I want to be a critical care anesthesiologist. That's what I love. That's what I'm passionate about. And he said, well, you will never match into any anesthesia program in the country. And I said, well, I respectfully disagree. That was gracious. I said, um, I think you're wrong. I think I will become an anesthesiologist. And I left that meeting. Um, and interestingly, I, I, I look back now and I wasn't, I wasn't saddened by it at all. Mm. I was furiously angry mm -hmm. and it motivated me. <laughs> and I took that and I said, I will show him. Right. <laughs> and uh, a few months later, there was... Um, the match day celebration uh, and they, you know, you're handed an envelope and you go on stage and you open your envelope and it says where you matched. Um, and so I go on stage and I open my envelope and it says that I matched at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, not only did I match into an anesthesia program, but I matched into one of the best in the country. And I was just <laughs> elated. Um, oh, and it. interestingly, I happened to bump into that man on the way out of the celebration. And uh, I looked at him and I said, see, I told you I could do it. I told you I could do it. And he said, well, we'll see. <gasps> and he just had to take that one more jab. And that one more jab, I think, motivated me even further. Um, and I went on to my residency and I absolutely loved it. And uh, it was just a wonderful place to be. And I did a residency and, and a fellowship and, um, and it was wonderful. And I never had any problems along the way. I believed I could do it. They believed I could do it. And it, it came to be and without any major really nothing you know I just I did what everybody else did because I knew I could and uh, and here we are now Trevor my lands those of us who are watching or listening there isn't anything you can't do just listen to that that's amazing and how wonderful that you had the grit where did that come from was your dad gritty or what absolutely both of my parents <laughs> were uh, my parents I told you were immigrants and raised eight children. Um, and to say they came from nothing is kind of an understatement. Um, and they worked so hard. And my, mo my <laughs> mom, uh, when she agreed to marry my father, um, she said, only if I can get a college education. And, uh, and so my dad worked three or four jobs at a time to uh, to make enough money to support their education, to support the family. My mom worked to put my father through college. My father worked to put my mother through college. And they were just both just intensely determined, determined people. Um, my mom will tell stories about uh, having to take three kids to college with her and have them sit oh, at her desk. A mom of yeah, three. Yeah. And so, um, so anyway, yes, they were they were fiercely dedicated, and I um, are fiercely determined people. And I uh, I grew up watching that, and um, you know it wasn't a question of if you will go to school; it was a question of where you will go to school, and and which you know, and are you just going to college? Or are you going to you know what's the next step from there? What mm. professional uh, school are you going to? And so. Um, so I think I got. I have to thank my parents for a lot of that uh, mm -hmm. determination and dedication. Absolutely. That's just well. So far, I mean, just look at the lessons we're learning and the things that you're bringing to us today. This is such an impactful uh, episode, Joffer. So you also mentioned that you still have biases. That things happen to you still. Like what? Um, it's uh you know it's it's 
I have a visible disability. I use a wheelchair. So when somebody sees me, um, they know right away that I'm uh, disabled. And I will say this, most of the time, truly most of the time, when I go into a patient's room and I introduce myself as their physician, not there is no hesitation. They say, hi, doctor, nice to meet you. And they listen to what I say. And it's like the wheelchair is not even there. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't even think twice about it. But every now and then, um, you know, you'll, you'll get funny looks. I'll get funny comments like, well, who's the patient, you or me? Um, mm-hmm. I got yelled at once when I was somebody, uh, 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 somebody <laughs> in the hospital, uh, it was a patient or a family member, they yelled at me for playing around in somebody's wheelchair. Oh, <laughs> you're kidding. I'm not. I said, no, not playing around. I was like, it is fun, but it's my this chair. This is mine. It's mine. Um, but really the, the bias, um, you know, comes from other people in medicine. There's a lot of stigma towards disability. Um, both in the public and in medicine. And uh, there's not, um, there aren't a lot of visibly disabled people in in medicine. And I'm sure there are a heck of a lot more um, people without visible disabilities that kind of keep it to themselves because they don't want to um, face any discrimination in, 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 in that people just make assumptions about things you can or cannot do Mm. based on your abilities, uh, physical abilities. Um, And there's no reason to do that. Um, You know, just like the the department chair that I had an an issue with, he made assumptions that I wasn't Mm. going to physically be able to be an anesthesiologist, but I've- You showed him. I've proved him wrong. you know, and and uh, so so yeah, those 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 biases are out there, especially when they see, um, especially if you can't see my wheelchair. I, I, I just the other day I, I parked in a in a parking spot, in a handicap parking spot, and I hand my had my handicap uh, you know parking permit, and uh, somebody just saw a you know youngish. I wish I could call myself young still, but a <laughs> you youngish uh, um, you know relatively fit person in a vehicle and started screaming at me for parking in a handicap spot. Wow. Um, and so, you know, people make assumptions based on what they what they see or can't see. Oh, my goodness. Did the man ever write his ship with you? No. He didn't? No. Um, I've thought about reaching out to him since, but... Um, I don't really want to. <laughs> and you wonder whether his son, in fact, became an NBA basketball player. You know player. what? Maybe if he, <laughs> if he had the determination, maybe he could have been. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, the joy of encouragement versus someone saying you can't. I had a similar thing happen, and I won't take the show time, but um, there was something in me, too, that said, you just watch. <laughs> don't ever say you can't. <laughs> Maybe some of you in the audience have that same feeling. Just say, I can't, and boy, watch me go. One of your, I always ask for your lessons learned, and that was one of them, (laughs) except I love the way you said it. You said, you can't stoke my fire. (laughs) That's a great one. Obviously, you said never give up. And you you also mentioned uh, before the show, Joffer, about your dad, back to your wonderful family and the journey of him with cancer and going through that. And um, part part of who you are as a doctor has so much to do with the empathy you have. Share with us what your dad told you. Absolutely, yes. Um, My dad, uh, he unfortunately passed away from cancer, lung cancer. Um, And uh, he was diagnosed when I was in in college and he passed away when I was in Mm. medical school, Mm. my second year of medical school. Um, And along that, along the way, um, I tried to be with him as much as possible for his medical appointments and his, uh, his treatments and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, All of us did that, you know, all of the children did as much as possible, but you know, 
people had moved away and things like that. So I tried to be, I was still local, so I tried to be there as much as possible. And every appointment that I went to with him and every treatment I went to with him, he would stop and he would point out things about what the, what the doctor did or how they did it or how they said it and uh, how he appreciated it or didn't appreciate it and what that person could have done better and not just the doctor but the the nursing staff and the uh, you know just everybody in the office and uh, it was and he would say when you are a doctor uh -huh. um, you, know, you should do this or you shouldn't do this or people aren't gonna like it when you say this or how you say it and so it was very educational to me because um, it about, was real it was real absolutely I wasn't I wasn't wasn't another doctor telling me oh patients don't like it when you say this or do this mm -hmm. this was an actual patient and mm -hmm. it was my father mm -hmm. um, who I you know loved and respected and so of course I'm gonna take what he says to heart um, and so I uh, yeah I, I learned a lot about being a patient through my father um, and of course I learned a lot about being a patient um, from myself uh, I was uh, uh, obviously I was a patient for a long time um, and I learned a lot I'm sure you did mm -hmm. and now married and three children yes they are Caden Cameron and Ava um, seven just about to be eight in a few days five and three <laughs> the two boys and a baby girl oh mm -hmm. and she's got you I'm sure wrapped around your little finger hundred <laughs> percent <100%. laughs> With the, um, I would just say the intensity of the work that you do, how do you keep your mojo up? Um, trying to truly have a separation uh, mm. between work and, and your non-work life is very important. It's very easy to get wrapped up in work and it can be all encompassing. Um, and, uh, and we can become so wrapped up in work that when we do go home and have that time with our family that we still spend that family time thinking about work and and um, turn it off yeah so you really ha I, I really try to turn it off i could be better i really could um my wife would agree i'm sure <laughs> but um i think you know i i i think the i just try to cherish the time outside of work and keep that separation as much as possible and i think that's what helps keep me energized and um but uh yeah my my, my family is a a big a big reason that i'm able to to keep my you know mojo up <laughs> <laughs> that smile is so beautiful for those of you who are watching on television and uh youtube and those who aren't he's just got a great big beautiful smile good looking teeth <laughs> <laughs> I know you must be fun loving too, Joffer, because you talked about how you met your wife. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us that. Uh, well, I, I met her um, at a bar. <laughs> and, That's a good uh, start. There, there was, uh, there was a, a karaoke involved, and uh, <laughs> I desperately tried to get her to sing a song with me, and she refused. <laughs> and she refuses to sing karaoke to this day. Um, so I, I, I sang a song for her, I guess. Oh. And, uh, but yeah, we, we met at a bar and, uh, it, it started, yeah, it started there and just, uh, continued. And here we are today with, you know, married, happily married with three kids, which is wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, just to be clear with the amount of work you do in a leadership role versus your practicing role, um, what percentage of the time are you teaching? in this new associate, right, associate position, professor, yes. which is uh -huh. awesome. Congratulations, Thank that's Thank huge. We need to go back and send this video to that person, whoever he is. <laughs> but uh, so talk, talk to us about teaching. Who are you teaching? Um, so I teach um, fellows, um, residents, and medical students. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I teach them both anesthesiology in the OR as well as uh, critical care in the ICU um, and so about 80% of my time is clinical work mm -hmm. and the other 20% is um, administrative in my leadership role uh, but in that 80% um, I'm teaching um, most of that time and it's uh, 
uh, sometimes in, in the form of um, formal lectures and, and presentations and things like that, but a lot of it is um, more on the, on the spot training, you mm -hmm. know, actually actively working on patients together uh, and that sort of education. Well, UT Southwestern is so lucky to have you as a physician, well, as one of many wonderful ones there, I know. Oh my goodness. Yes, it's a wonderful place to be. What uh, a wonderful place to be. So if you could tell a patient, let's turn it around uh -huh. now, and the audience are patients. Uh -huh. <laughs> God forbid if anything comes that they have to have a doctor and anesthesiologist. What would be one or two questions I as a patient should ask you? Um, <laughs> Got funny. you stumped? I've never, yeah, I've never, oh, really good. Thought, I've never really thought about that. Um, <laughs> but um, questions they should ask me probably, um, you know, a lot of people don't know what an anesthesiologist is or what they do. Exactly. So one question could be, what does an anesthesiologist do? <laughs> what are you what, going what to do you, with what me? What are you going to do? You know, mm -hmm. I, they, they know they're going to go to sleep and they're going to wake up, but how does that, what does that mean? How does that happen? What, what's the in-between like? Um, so I think that's probably a good question. Um, and we, we hope that our patients trust us to be doing the right things and, and the, the best thing for them and that we're going to take excellent care of them. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's, uh, I think it's okay. And it's to say, well, what does that mean? How does that look? Right. What are you actually going to do? Um, so I think that's probably a good question to ask. Well, there you go, yeah. audience. You've got a, a insight from the man who should know. <laughs> One more question. I like this question because of the work I do in personal branding and presence. What would be one word you would use to describe yourself? as a brand one word that describes you at your core outgoing i think that's a good one <laughs> yeah i've uh i've always been an outgoing person um but i just i love people i love to talk to people i love to meet people um uh my wife will point out i'm always trying to be the center of attention <laughs> well that's good <laughs> but uh I, I love to tell jokes. Most of them people would say are bad jokes, but I love to tell jokes. Um, one joke that I tell almost all of my patients um, before I put them to sleep, as I say, a bear walks into a bar and he sits down and he looks at the bartender and says, hey, can I get a beer? And the bartender says, sure, but why the big paws? <laughs> Joffrey, you're incredible. <laughs> my patients say, just put me to sleep. I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> oh, my gosh. If you ever go to UT Southwestern, you've got to ask for this man to be your anesthesiologist. <laughs> I don't want to leave out your other points of view, your your lessons learned, <laughs> Joffrey. Um, two of them. One was be nice to people, and the other one, give others the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. and fully explain why, all three of those. I think, um, yeah, be nice to people. Um, it's so simple, isn't it's it? It's so simple. Um, you know, there was that great book a long time ago, Everything I Need to, uh, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, kindergarten. or something like mm -hmm. that. It's so true. Just be nice to people. There's no reason. There's really almost never a reason to be, to be mean to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're nice to people, mm -hmm. you're more likely to get what you're – looking for and to accomplish what you're trying to do um and uh um it just you know it makes it makes life so much easier when if you're nice to people people are going to be nice back can and, i can i tell you a story on that of course <coughs> excuse me so last weekend many of you in the audience know i told this story on another episode which was i was having coffee and I just had this idea of being nice to people, meaning kind. What? When was the last time, Valerie, you intentionally were kind to people? I, I think I'm a pretty kind person, generally speaking, but 
when was the last time, Valerie, I ask self, that I intentionally said, what if I determined, made a choice to be kind to someone every day? And so I found a hashtag, Joffer. You have to have a hashtag if you're going to tweet something out. I'm learning so much about social media. And it is this, audience, you know this because I've talked about it. And it's on the screen. Hashtag rekindling your kindness. And so I've got a movement going on and I want you, the audience, to be part of it. I'm going to keep this going. Post on social media, wherever you post. Just put hashtag rekindling your kindness and tell us what you did. But don't just do it once because we want you to do something good every day or post something that someone did for you. If we can keep this kind of thing uppermost in people's minds, what a different world we'll live Absolutely. in. Absolutely. And that's what Absolutely. you're saying. Yeah. What about, uh, what about the one on, obviously, I, I, I think this is going to be doctor talk, active listener here, don't no, listen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, um, and I think that's important. Uh, not only with my patients, but also within my leadership position mm -hmm. to truly listen. Don't, don't just hear people, but listen to what they have to say um, and acknowledge what they're saying um, and, uh, and, and take their feedback and take, mm. their, take their criticisms. And there's always, um, there's always something that you can get from that conversation, even if you don't like that conversation, mm -hmm. if somebody's giving you uh, constructive criticism and you may not believe it, if somebody's telling, telling it to you, there's probably some truth to it. Um, and so I think it's important to be, um, to be humble and to truly uh, listen to what people have to say, especially if it's about you. Um, but if it's about you know other things that you can help with, mm -hmm. then listen to what they have to say and 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 try to try to make a difference. Uh, try to try to help with what they're asking for. So I think um, that's truly good. listening and not hearing. Yeah, which means have a blank slate. Don't be thinking about what you're going to say next. Exactly. <laughs> Which I try to do on the show, honestly, I will tell you. It helps. I try to have a blank slate, and I am truly just listening mm -hmm. so that it can be what I hope this is for our listeners, a conversation. Right. And, and it, listening is not always easy. No, and it takes time. It takes and time. We don't and always have that time, but it's important to make the time to listen to others. Uh, Jafaran, moving from that to kind of in the same vain listening and and when you are a doctor you're listening to the patient and you mentioned the importance of explaining the why mm -hmm. absolutely um, I find that to be very um, very important and very beneficial um, to explain why why something's going to happen why something's happening why we're doing what we're doing and again this applies to both my patients with why you know specific treatments sure. uh, that we're, we're giving to them or you know why it's important that you know they go through this painful procedure when obviously they might not want it so it's very important to explain why mm -hmm. so that they truly can understand um, and it's also important in leadership especially when when enacting change um, you know, don't just dictate. This is this is changing, and this is how we're going to do things now. Um, I think it's important to explain the why things are changing, um, uh, and because when people understand the why, mm -hmm. they're much more likely to to comply and to to do what you're asking of them. Um, they still may not like it, but if they understand why, um, they're much more likely to do it. And I mean, I I find that is the case personally too. I, if you tell me to do something, I may or may not do it, but if you tell me why you're asking me to do it, I say, okay, even though I don't like it, it makes sense. I, At least I'll, they've I'll got a it. chance with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And you know the saying, nobody likes change but a wet baby. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Joffrey, thank you so much for being on the show. And we're putting up on the banner uh, how people can reach you should they have any questions or just want to 
say thanks for being on the show. And listeners do that. You know, it means so much to the guests. It really does. If you reach out and make a comment on the episodes, because then it lets the guests know that you've enveloped something important from what they've said. So we would invite you always to do that. And I invite you, if you want to get a deeper understanding of your brand and how to show up with presence, I would love to work with you in your company or individually in coaching. All you have to do is email Valerie at ValerieAndCompany.com because we focus on the soft skills. They bring the hard dollars, don't you know? <laughs> Until next time, here's my Valerieism. Bye for now. So here is my Valerieism for you. And it is this, it's okay to glance back in the rear view mirror, but keep your eye focused on what's in front. And what I mean by that is there are so many times in life when you just keep looking back at, well, what I did do, well, what I didn't do, well, what I should do, get those shoulds and dids and all of that out. There is always a path forward. Keep your eye not on the rear view mirror. Those are all great things. And clearly, they likely bubbled up the strengths that are just your DNA, those things that have brought you success. Well, it's those very same things that are going to bring you future success if you stop focusing on back and start focusing on what's next. What exciting new opportunities do I have? And that's my Valerieism. Let me tell you again. It's okay to glance back in the rearview mirror, but focus your eyes on what's in front of you. Thanks for listening. To receive Valerie's voice, free monthly leadership tips, and to learn more about her leadership programs and coaching, visit her website, ValerieAndCompany.com. Next week, we'll be here again to inspire, engage, and equip you with teachable points of view from successful leaders who have been doing it right. Until then, lead authentically.